Welcome back to the Demystify Sci podcast. I'm Michael Shiloh. I'm Anastasia. Today we have Dr. Mike McCullough from the University of Plymouth talking about quantized inertia, a new way of looking at how it is that physical bodies stay put or stay in motion and what's going on there. And what's really, really cool about his work is that it's highly integrative. He's taken an assessment of the the unsolved mysteries in physics and tried to address them in a very integrative, a very mm, simplified fashion. Yeah, definitely. He's clearly thought really deeply about these questions through the lens of Mach's principle, which is the idea that the physical phenomena that we see around us are not due to some intrinsic property of the objects that are producing the phenomena. It is the result of the interactions of the cosmos, and we love that. The sum total of everything in the universe conspiring to affect your local environment. If you enjoy the conversation, share it with somebody. That's how we reach people. Please leave a comment. Tell us what you think. Tell us if you have ideas. Tell us if you liked this line of investigation, if you hated it. Honestly, if you watch, just leave a comment. Leave a comment. It helps tremendously with the algorithm for whatever reason. I think because it's, I don't know, something about like platform engagement or something, I'm sure. But if you're watching and you have a YouTube account, just drop, even just say hi. That'll, that, that would be enough. 100%. If you've already done that, um, consider coming over to our Patreon and join the community so that we can get your regular input. We have a, a nice close-knit circle where we hang out once a week and discuss what should be happening on the show, what's exciting in the world that we should be exploring more of, and we'd love to see you there. Enjoy the conversation. We'll see you next time. The scientific revolution starts now. I'm trying to understand inertial mass. I've suggested a new model for inertial mass, and that get, gets rid of a lot of problems in astrophysics, such as the galaxy rotation problem. And it also suggests an entirely new physics. Why is inertial mass not understood as it stands? It's always been assumed. So ever since Newton said, or or Galileo before him, that things tend to keep going in straight lines until you push on them, it's, it's almost been just language. There's been no mechanical model for it. So, in my opinion, I've provided the first mechanical model for inertial mass to explain why things keep going in straight lines. Mm. And the flip side of that, I guess, is why do they stay still when they're, you know, why is it difficult to move something that's at rest, essentially? Yes, but as, as relativity uh, teaches us, the, the velocity is, is not, does not really matter. It's... Um, it, it's it's meaningless really to talk about a speed because it's a speed relative to to what? Yeah, well, so, to something else, I guess. It's difficult. Yeah, I guess yes. motion doesn't yeah. make sense without at least two bodies, right? That's right. Yes. So that's l- like Max principle, isn't it? Mm, yes, Max principle. Love it. We love Max principle. Uh, I'd be curious to get into that. I remember I was having a conversation with my brother. And he's a computer programmer, and I was trying to explain to him the idea of inertia through Mach's principle, and I explained to him what Mach's principle was, which is that, I mean, it's it's interconnection on a fundamental level. Well, I mean, yeah, I guess like in, in Mach's words, it's more just that things far away affect things that are, like the entire universe affects. What's happening here? And I told him that, and he's like, that sounds crazy. And I was like, I, I, it's a named principle, and we looked it up, and I think that it wasn't, wasn't it Einstein who formulated it? Well, Einstein drew heavily upon it, I guess, from what I understand. I'm not an Einstein scholar by any stretch, but a but, lot of people have drawn on it, right? And I don't, I don't think Mach called it Mach's principle or anything like that. <laughs> but but I think, that's right, and it's quite vague as well. Right. But I, I'll, I'll try and explain how I, I think I have the first theory that incorporates it. Um. Mac had this this famous. Uh, it was actually Newton who who started it with the Newton's bucket, where you have a spinning bucket, 
and the um, the surface of the the water becomes concave. And he argues that's not because of its motion relative to the side of the bucket, but relative to its because it's responding to its motion relative to the rest of the cosmos. But Mac had the famous question: What would happen if instead of rotating the bucket in the cosmos, you rotated the cosmos around the bucket? And that there is no theory which could explain what would happen or predict what would happen in that case. But my my theory does explain that. What's the difference? Between rotating the bucket or rotating the cosmos, <laughs> is there a difference? Well, uh, well, it was it was unknown, but what I predict is that when you start rotating the bucket, uh, sorry, the cosmos around the bucket, the bucket will will rotate with it, which is a newly predicted effect. And I actually have some empirical evidence for that in the flyby anomalies, which are spacecraft passing by the Earth. Hmm. And it turns out that if they if they leave on the equator, they have a different behavior than if they leave close to the spinning pole. And I can predict that. And that that's a direct observation of Max principle, in, in my opinion. Can you elaborate on that? Well, it's it's probably difficult to do it before I explain the theory itself. Okay. Well, so let's let's do that. Do you have? You said that you wanted to pull up a slide. Yes. Okay. I'll I'll share a screen. <clears throat> so, the idea is that we have this ball here, this black ball, and we assume it's accelerating to the right. So this way, mm. and according to quantum mechanics, when anything accelerates it sees a kind of radiation, which is called Unruh radiation, proposed by Bill Unruh from Canada in about 1976. And I've shown this radiation with the red color, and this radiation pushes on the object. It uh, hits it from all directions. Mm. But also, according to Einstein, from this area on the, the left, this black area... The non-radiating side. Or non-radiation yes. receiving side. That that's right. This object will never know what's in this black area because information travels at the speed of light. So accelerating to the right, information from this area will never catch up to it. So there's a, a kind of shadow zone here and a horizon separating it from the, the rest of the universe. The the new thing I'm suggesting is that this horizon damps the only radiation in just the same way as if it was a Casimir effect occurring between the object and the horizon. So I've shown that with the blue here. Can you explain yeah. Casimir effect for us? Yes. The, the Casimir effect from physics is if you have two parallel metal plates and you place them within a micron or so of each other, then the, the quantum waves that are usually ubiquitous in space everywhere cannot fit between the plates. So that means there are more quantum waves outside the plates than inside. So there's a net force inwards pushing the plates together. And that has been observed in the lab. Do the plates have to be charged? They don't have to be charged, but they do have to be conducting. Uh, so what's happening is the electrons are moving within the plates and cancelling the, uh, the quantum fields creating a sort of um, uh, a super vacuum, if you like, between the plates, which sucks them together. Mm. And is, th is this distinct from the way that current carrying wires attract? Yes, this is, this is a quantum effect. And although some people claim it is a van der Waals force, a van der Waals attraction, there's a bit of a debate about, about it. Mm. But I'm assuming it's a quantum effect and that the same effect occurs whenever you have an accelerating object and a horizon. So you see in the picture, there's more red on this side of the, the ball. So it gets hit more from this side than from this side, and it gets pushed back against its acceleration. So this provides a model for inertial mass. And if you calculate it, you, you get a result close enough, given the uncertainties in the calculation, 
to exactly predict inertial mass, what we see as inertial mass. So it's like a, a photon pressure. There's a shadow from the photon pressure. I guess yes. the photon pressure itself is the inertial resistance in this model. That's, that's right. Although okay. I now have a, a different way to, to derive it using information. But that's another story. That's really interesting. Yeah, I, I, I guess the ubiquity of photon pressure is, is really curious, right? Like everywhere you would go in the universe, you're going to be receiving light from somebody and it's going to put a slight pressure on you. What about gravity though? Because I, I always think about gravity as being uh, the opposite side of that because just as you're getting pushed on by different atoms, you're also getting tugged on by the same atoms. Well, that's, that's true. And this, this theory also explains gravity in a very similar way. So gravity is a sheltering effect of these of this Onru radiation between bodies. Mm, like between, Lesage or something. Yes, uh, but Lesage model had a defect in that the radiation occurred at all times. Th this, this is different because the Onru radiation only occurs when you accelerate. Mm. You know, only in a particular direction. So whereas Lesage was disproven because the, there should have been radiation in front of orbiting bodies, slowing them down, in this case, there wouldn't be. Mm -hmm. There's some thermodynamic problems with Lesage too, which I've never fully comprehended. Um, some, some arguments about uh, overheating with this constant bombardment of particles. Yes, that's, that's true. And the interesting thing about Onru radiation is that it's only, it's only perceived by the accelerating object. I mean, that's very interesting. So, so somebody in the same space as the accelerating object would not see the heat, but the accelerating object would. So that's very bizarre. So inertia has to do with continuing to move in a straight line as much as it does with the resistance to starting to move. And so if this yep. is an acceleration-based model, why, how does it relate to something that experiences inertia when it's moving much slower than the speed of light? So this, this applies to any acceleration that you, you have. Um, it, if, if an object has a speed that's constant, then it won't see a horizon at all. And so it, it wouldn't have an inertial mass in this model. Because it's case, receiving the radiation from all sides at that point? Yes, yes, hmm. exactly. And, and also, can I just show one other slide? Mm. Yeah. So if the acceleration is incredibly low, so here's the ball again, and it, its acceleration is incredibly low, as for stars at the edge of galaxies, for example, then this horizon moves so far away that it goes beyond the part of the cosmos that we can actually see. That there is a part of the cosmos from which information could not have got to us in the the age of the universe, and that's called the the Hubble horizon. And if this horizon goes beyond that, then it becomes irrelevant, and the cosmic horizon damps the under waves all the way around symmetrically. So this predicts that the process of inertia will not but will collapse for very low accelerations that's that's interesting and that's interesting it, it fits really nicely with the definition for the universe that astronomers will finally come down to if you squeeze them hard enough which is the edge of what we can see essentially right yes. people people have this very <clears throat> conflated idea like philosophers tend to think of the universe as everything in existence but astronomers really, when pushed, will, it's sort of like when pushed about time, like they'll, they'll be like, it's what a clock does. But when, when you talk about astro astronomy and the, the radius of the universe, it's really just a, a matter of how far we can see. Yes, that's So that right. makes sense. Uh, there are different ways of looking at it. Some people would say this Hubble horizon is a distance at which things are moving away from us faster than light because the speed of recession increases as you go away. But I say I prefer the idea that it's just the distance from which information could have 
got to us in the age of the universe, or at least our part of it. What is this? What 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 do you mean by information in a physical sense? Like, um, like information. I hear you talking about information moving around, and I, and that's um, it's hard for me to imagine that. Can, okay, can you... pho- photons. Then uh, I suppose I could say <clears throat> photons. Mm, photons makes sense. That they carry they carry information. So um, so we're t- we're ultimately talking about the f- photons being unable to reach back, essentially. That's right, yes. So photons from beyond this boundary would never, could not have got to us in the age of the universe, uh, if there is such a thing. Yeah, it seems like it's interesting because it doesn't really depend on there having to be an age of the universe, necessarily. <clears throat> that's that's right. So what, what the theory predicts as well is that well, there are different ways to interpret it, but it it doesn't need an expansion of the cosmos. Mm. Just an expansion of the horizon that we can know. So it's kind of an expansion of information rather than a physical expansion. But why would the horizon, why would the information horizon expand? That's because as time goes on, information can reach us from further and further away. And that defines the horizon, so. So over time, but it seems like what you're saying here is that there is, is okay, so is there a fixed horizon or is it a horizon that will in perpetuity be moving outward? It will move outwards all the time at the speed of light. It, it almost strikes me like ripples on a pond sort of disintegrate, like I don't know what the word is, but dissipating, I guess. Uh, at great distance, right? You you don't necessarily feel a ripple from the other side of the ocean. This so this Unless makes me huge. think of of redshift, which is it increases as you go to the edge of the cosmos. And so I wonder if you have a if your theory deals with redshift and how does it do so? Yes, so that's a very good question. So the usual idea is that. As you look further and further away, things are moving away faster and faster from us, and the the light emitted is redshifted because of the Doppler shift. So what I say instead, what the model says, is that when you look at objects very far away, you're looking at them in the distant past, when the universe was smaller, and because the physics I'm proposing depends on the size of the universe, this changes the inertial mass of the electrons in the atoms in such a way that they have less energy because they have less mass. Because, so they're, they emit. because they're interacting with more, it's, it's like a divisible property? It, it's because they're, they're in a smaller universe. So their inertial mass is lower. So the energy they contain is lower. And so the, the uh, light they emit upon electron transition is redshifted. Why is yeah? Can you can you break down for me? I, I missed something about the smallness of the universe related to the inertial mass. Can you explain that? The usual thing I do at this stage is to show the equation, but I I can't I can't really do that. But all I can say then is that as the well, maybe just explain it with like three atoms or something, right? Say the universe only had three atoms and there's light between the three of them, and then you move them apart, right? Is that the idea? Or you're saying there's less atoms in the first place or something like that? So... Like, what do you mean by smaller universe, I guess, is what I'm trying to understand. Okay, so in, in the, this, at the... At the moment, we see the edge of the cosmos is about 10 to the 26 meters away because light has had a lot of time to get to us from that, that distance. In our distant past, the universe would have been smaller because we could only see we would only be able to see to a much smaller distance. Presumably because the atoms would have been closer to us? Or that fewer atoms had had time to interact. So I guess the question mm. is yes, that's what right. is yes. so so this is the the interaction is mediated by light fundamentally. Yes. 
And so as, as, you're, as the horizon expands, what's expanding is the place that you are standing is being reached by more and more light in a, circul- in, in a spherical way. And so you're basically at this focal point of a gradually expanding sphere of light and everything is yes, feeding right. back onto you. And as there's more atoms that have more light impinging on things at the center, it changes the energy, it changes the energy of the electron. Or am I off? It changes the inertial mass, the, the phenomenon. That's right. Yeah. It, yes, because the, the, the inertial mass collapses in the theory when this Rindle horizon, this close horizon, goes behind the cosmic horizon. And if the cosmic horizon is much closer, then that occurs at a much lower acceleration. So inertial mass, sorry, a much higher acceleration. So inertial mass is 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 less. And the Rindler horizon is the one that you were you were showing in the first slide, which is that as the particle that's is right. accelerating, it's the it's the it's that break that's behind its path of motion. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So let me see if I can if I if I can. I, I think that one last piece that I'm missing for this is like a single sentence definition for inertial mass. Or a brief so, definition. I feel like a sentence is a lot to ask for. Uh, yeah, can I try it? And you can tell me if, if I got it or not? Yes, yes, please do. <laughs> All right. So I, I think what he's saying is that inertial mass is the result of interactions that occur during acceleration. These are photonic interactions, essentially, and they they appear um, as a resistance to motion, to acceleration, essentially. So it makes the object seem heavier. Yes. Yeah. And so, yeah. And so I'm not, sh- I'm not, I mean, I think I understand the cosmology is just that there's more interactions available on this timeline of the universe as it evolves under this Big Bang type thing. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a Big Bang, right? Because well, it's an inception. Yeah. So that's the so that's another piece that I want to fold in. Okay. So we have inertial mass that, as a particle accelerates, it is heavier because it's being pushed on by the things that are out in front of it. The light. The light. Via the light. Yes. Via the light. Via the light. Yeah, I think the, that's important. Well, it's a quantum background, really, uh, but they are photons as well, so virtual photons. Wait, what do you mean by quantum background? The the unruh radiation is a, a quantum radiation. It's a, a random thermal thing. It's a, like a, a warm bath of photons. So they are, they are photons, but they are from quantum mechanics. Well, presumably they're coming from an atom somewhere, right? It's hard to imagine light without an atom making it happen. This this can happen. It's it's well known that there's a, a quantum uh, background, uh, a zero point field, if if you like. Um, so it, the way that we when we do the material atomics explanations, we uh, model the photon is traveling along an interconnection between atoms. So, uh, to, to do, you, <laughs> Shiloh always gets nervous when I start to talk about this. I'm not nervous. I'm not nervous. I'm just being careful. So the, I guess the, qu- I mean, you're diving into like a, a pit of snakes about the photon is an activity, right? Would you agree that the photon's an activity? So it must be occurring within some actor, like some actor must be participating in the activity. It's it's not possible to imagine an activity without an actor, essentially. And so we and, end up... And if you go to quantum field theorists, they'll tell you that there is not an actor, there's just the field, and the field is a measurement, and that's kind of the, the, the baseline of reality. And so we were frustrated by that, and we were like, okay, what if there actually is an actor? What would be the architecture of that actor that would allow for something to be moving to generate the measurement? And so, we do you know Carver Mead? I've I've heard of him. Yeah, he was a he was a big uh, semiconductor guy at Caltech. He uh, worked with Feynman back in the day, and he at the sort of and the latter part of his career started to get really preoccupied by the fact that he thought that uh, quantum electrodynamics was uh, 
overly complicated? It was overly complicated. And he was like, I think that you can simplify this by going back to the work of Gian Loomis, who at some point was like, light is not something that radiates into space. Light has to be something that is a communication between atoms. And so if you simplify down to a single atom universe, you can't have light because it's not just this like stuff that gets shot away. It's Yes, I like that idea. Yeah. So if you have two atoms and they're in communication, then you in, there's a connection that's between them and the light travels along that, we call it a filament. And mm. you can kind of model it roughly off the electron, the radial distribution function of the electron, which goes off to infinity. If you treat the electron as the surface of the atom. Yeah, so if the electron is the surface of the atom, the surface of the atom goes off to infinity, but it's it's very, very, it's a very, very small amount of it. It's like point, either 0. 0.01 or 0.001% of the atom extends. And so if those extensions are, are significant, then those extensions would be running between all of the atoms in the universe. And so your zero point energy is the sort of the baseline readout of the interconnections. And so as you increase the number of atoms that are connected to one another and could transmit light, then you have an increase in the zero point energy of the universe because you have more filaments in a cross section of space. And the photon travels between atoms. And so it sounds like what I you're guess... Go ahead. Sorry, go on. No, no, go ahead. The so the the honor radiation is I think quite a an accepted prediction of quantum field theory. And it's supposed to be a wave in all the fields. So matter waves as well as light. So I guess I'm trying to say that the the actor that you're looking for is also present in the Unru field. Yeah. I mean that that would it would be unfortunate if it wasn't because I feel like that would invalidate <laughs> that would invalidate the project. Um and so I guess I'm so you you have let's say a smaller can we call it a light cone? Yes, I suppose you could. Yes. So you have a smaller light cone, and in that smaller light cone you have fewer connections by virtue of fewer atoms being inside of that light cone. Mm. And then as you expand the light cone, you have more atoms. And so what does your theory say about the transition between fewer atoms to larger atoms in terms of the physical properties of the object within that light cone, let's say the electron. So the more the more interactions you have, the higher the inertial mass is, which which seems to make intuitive sense. Mm -hmm. I've not particularly thought about it that, that way before, you know, counting up the number of interactors, but it's an interesting way to look at it. What what causes the light cone to expand? Because it seems like if there is a light cone that expands, it requires a genesis moment. Well, I suppose so. There must have been a time when our part of the universe was created. and But I, I try not to get too, too hung up on... <laughs> Things like that. I mean, I think people should try to predict galaxy rotation before talking about the beginning of, of everything. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, let's talk about galaxy rotation. That's a huge astrophysical. I was going to yes. ask, like, what this, you know, we had a really, do you know Mike Levin at Tufts? He does this really fascinating bioengineering stuff. I've heard of him as well, but. Yeah, Mike put, Mike uh, said something really pr profound the other day about science in general and evaluating a scientific theory. And he was like, what does it allow you to do? Like, what new questions can you address that haven't been able to be addressed by the former theory? And so I, I really want to hear about this yes. galactic rotation business because that's a nightmare, of course. Okay, so the, the problem is, of course, when you have uh, every galaxy that they can see spins far too fast at the edge. So 
the gravitational mass that they calculate from the light in the galaxy is too small to hold on to the stars at the edge. So, of course, they add dark matter, but I don't like that explanation because they add it just where they need it to make the theory work, and that seems rather unscientific. And it turns out that what I'm proposing predicts galaxy rotation exactly and without dark matter. So this is what I was saying earlier, that if the acceleration is very low, this this Rindler horizon moves behind the cosmic horizon. So instead of having an asymmetry in the under radiation on both sides causing inertia, now you've got a symmetrical distribution of under radiation and no it or less inertial mass. Because it's interacting with, with less, right? Less, I mean, there's less interaction, set, there's less accel acceleration, relatively speaking. Because there's less acceleration, the Rindler horizon moves further away, very far away. And so it's behind the cosmic horizon now. So the under radiation distribution is now symmetrical, <clears throat> as in the second, the second picture I showed. So there is effectively no inertial mass. So it, it I'm, collapses. I'm thinking about that second picture that you showed. And in the second picture you showed, you had this object that was surrounded by a circular field. And on the right side, you had the cosmic background or the cosmic horizon. And on the left side was the Rindler horizon. And it, does it, if, and that's that's hard for me to totally understand. Is it more that the cosmic horizon is circular around that entire space and the Rindler horizon is like outside of that? That's right, yes. So yes. the cosmic horizon is a um, symmetrical sphere, so it can't produce any force because the distribution of this onu radiation is the same from all directions. Whereas if the acceleration is high, then you get this Rindler horizon coming very close. You can think of it that, that a horizon attracts in a way. So when you have a close Rindler horizon, it pulls the object back against its acceleration. And put this into context of, of the galactic rotation problem for me. So this predicts that at a particular acceleration, the, um, the Rindler horizon will move behind the cosmic horizon, and at exactly that point, the inertial mass will start to disappear. This means that the centrifugal force, if you put it that way, on the star, pushing it outwards, will decrease. And if you apply the theory to galaxy rotation, it predicts the behavior exactly. You get the edge stars with less inertial mass and less centrifugal force, so the little amount of mass we can see in the galaxy can hold them in. And it works exactly, and there's no adjustment needed to the theory. It predicts it exactly. And I've published this in many papers. That's so interesting. Yeah, it's almost like there is, they have less photon pressure out there. It's essentially what it comes down to. Yes, it's a bit like that, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to conceptualize it on the order of the cosmic horizon, though, be, because are we talking about this as bordered by the massive interaction of things inside the galaxy, or are we still talking about it in terms... It's a local phenomenon, I guess, I think. I'm just trying to jump yeah, in there, yeah. because I think, like, I wouldn't get too lost in that terminology, because it's just telling you what your interactome is like. It's like your local interactome is, is less. That's your horizon, essentially. I guess I'm still trying. So well, it's it's easy for me to think about it in terms of like a single particle that's that's moving and is being is being affected. And for some reason, I'm having a hard time like getting a mental picture of the galaxy and how like this mixes. Well, um, so for for stars in the center of the galaxy, their acceleration is relatively high. So they see a Rindler horizon. Uh, where would it be? <clears throat> Um, so it's it will it's pull. closer. Yes, so the acceleration is towards the center of the galaxy, so the Rindler horizon will be out, and it will pull them out, and this will be their centrifugal force. But as you go out to greater radii in the galaxy, at some point you'll reach a star whose acceleration is so slow in its orbit that the Rindler horizon will be exactly on the cosmic horizon. 
And then for the star beyond that, the Rindle horizon will be outside the cosmic horizon. So its inertial mass should decrease. And when you look at the data, you see that exactly the, at exactly the point that you predict that the Rindle horizon is on the boundary, on the cosmic horizon, that is when galaxies start to misbehave. Beyond that radius, they, they do not obey Newtonian mechanics. And that proves that it has to be on radiation and quantized inertia that's causing it. Mm. Because it's it's exactly the, the the exact radius. That's very that's I, I, and that's, I where love that. that's where the mathematics that's where the quantitative uh, you know s depiction becomes very useful. Yeah, of course, because yeah. I'm like I'm fundamentally allergic to mathematics. I spent a lot of time in the car <laughs> as a child with my dad making me do mental math problems and then yelling when I didn't get them right. And so as an adult, I have a very tenuous and tentative relationship to mathematics. And so I understand its utility, but I, I feel like I approach it from the standpoint of like, okay, at least let's understand the, the pieces that are, that are interacting. I think you need both. You need intuition and mathematics. And I think Feynman was, or Feynman was very good at that. He had both capabilities. Did you come at this from an? In how did you? How did you come to this? Because this is not the way that most people think. I came to it from physical oceanography, ocean physics. Hmm. I studied good. waves at the UK Met Office, <laughs> and I learned about a thing called the maritime Casimir effect, uh. which is if you have two ships side by side, there'll be fewer waves between them, so the waves on the outside of them will push them together. Hmm. So then I, I was also interested in astronomy and physics, of course, and so I applied it to, uh, uh, to physics. Mm. You, know, you know what I love about this that I haven't loved about Lesage ideas is that it seems integrative, right? You're, you're using the photon and standard empirically derived quantum mechanics to explain something. Like you're not, you don't have to invent anything new to, to make this explanation make sense. It's kind of like... For me, it just seems like it's a statement of how photon pressure has been ignored, whatever, however you want to put that. But that's what it seems like to me, which is, I think, really brilliant. The, the only new thing I'm saying is I'm allowing relativity to talk to quantum mechanics. Mm. So I'm, I'm allowing this horizon to damp the quantum field. Yeah. That, that's the only radical thing in it. Have people been resistant to this idea? Yes, <laughs> most <laughs> most people have have been resistant. I, I guess that's par, par for the course, really. That that tends to happen. Most people believe in dark matter. I think still, but. Uh, well, it's you can't ask for well, you can ask for a lot of money to build dark matter detectors, but it, it might be harder to build a. You don't really need to build a machine to understand this idea. It's the kind of the the trouble of working in a purely theoretical space. If you can look at a bunch of data that's already there and explain things better, then you know how do you really build a huge research program around that and capture the public? I mean, people love dark stuff too. Let's be honest, the magic, you know. It's like, and that's that's yes. no small phenomenon, <laughs> right? It's like where people want the magic back. They lost, they lost religion in the last century or so. I mean, not not by and large, but it's obviously not as popular, and people miss the magic. Yeah, that's interesting. Maybe maybe that's part of it. But the great thing about this is that it brings cosmology into the lab. Mm. Because the thing I haven't mentioned before is that I, I say that horizons attract. You can think of it that horizons attract. I think you can make a horizon from a metal plate. So, because a metal plate is rather like a horizon, because electrons can move and cancel the quantum field. And it's already been shown in the Casimir effect that if you put two plates together, they, they attract. Well, I, I think we can do, we can do better. <clears throat> so, I, I, I said this in a paper about, what was it, seven, seven years ago, and then DARPA invited me to apply for funding to test this in the lab. Mm. <clears throat> and what you can do is you can, uh, 
you can have a very highly accelerated system. For, for example, picture an electron jumping between two plates, two metal plates. And that will produce extremely intense unirradiation. And then if you make the system asymmetrical, you put a, another metal plate in there, or you, you can just use two plates, actually, then the Unruh field will become inhomogeneous in space, and it will push on the object, and then you can have a new kind of thrust. Mm. Let's un let's un let's unpack that a little bit. I want to spaceships. Well, yeah, definitely. So, how does so when you say that you make the system asymmetrical? What does that mean? So you have to have a very intense unru field and then damp it in one place and not in another place, and then things will move from the the second place to the first place in a new way. They will float down the quantum the gradient in the quantum vacuum, if you like. Can you imagine what that kind of a uh, propulsion system would look like? Would it be like, how do you have a trailing plate and a leading? How do you, how do you set up that asymmetry in a propulsion system? Well, a, cu a couple of engineers read, read my papers and they, they came up with the, the capacitor. They, they had looked at a capacitor before and seen some odd thrusts coming from it and they read my papers and they said oh maybe it's this so they they tested it and they they sent me their data and the theory predicts exactly what the thrust they were seeing hmm. so i set up a lab at here at plymouth to uh, try that as well and also an american company called ivo limited tried as well and they're actually launching a, a test article into space in mm. June, June 10th, to see if they can see this thrust in space. Are, are you getting measurable eff effects here in the lab? Yes, it's, it's quite hard to get. So it only works so far in 30% of cases. But we've shown it's reversible. So if you turn the capacitor upside down, it, it thrusts down. And if you turn it the other way up, it thrusts up. It's in line with the theory, <clears throat> and the theory predicts that if you, uh, if you narrow the, the gap between the capacitors, if you halve the gap, then you should get four times the force. So I thought we should try to look for that, and we, we have seen that as well. So there's a 1 over d squared dependence there. Why do you think that it's so inconsistent? Why do you only see it 30% of the time? Well... <laughs> Yes, that's a good question. The, I think what's happening, what we do is we put a, a dielectric in between the capacitor plates. We, we want the electrons to jump across at an incredibly high speed, so the acceleration is very high. That, that produces other waves which are short enough to interact with the capacitor, otherwise it just won't work. So unless the, the electrons jump across, it's not going to it's not going to happen. And we found that uh, th these two engineers, Becker and Bat, found that you have to heat it up to about 50 degrees C to get the electrons to jump across in this way. It's, it's almost like quantum tunneling. Why does it this... Doesn't... Oh, go ahead. So, so my, my answer would be that it, it doesn't always happen. <laughs> Only in 30% of cases does it seem to happen at the moment. But why that's does, more than we had at the beginning. Why does increasing temperature affect the effect? That's associated with the... It, it's similar to the photoelectric effects. The electrons have more thermal energy to use to jump out. Uh, there's, there's something called the work function in metals. You need a certain amount of energy to get the electron out. And if you provide heat, you, you help them. And does the dielectric... Effect, I assume that you would have to have a really high dielectric material in order to generate sufficient speed. Yes, that's right. We use Kapton, which is... Um, I feel like I know that. Yes, it's, it's used in space a lot. It's very... Uh, yeah, three, uh, I think it's 308 
volts per micron or something. That's the dielectric breakdown of it. It's got a very high dielectric break breakdown. So it's, it's like a barrier. We put in between the plates this barrier. And in order to jump across, the electrons have to be very energetic. And that encourages them to leap at great speed. But for right now, it seems like the experiment is run across really, really small distances. Because the Casimir effect you said was on the order of micron separation between plates. That, that's right, yes. So the plates are only about 10 microns apart in our experiment. And so do you think that that's something that's possible to scale up? Or is that separation the the order of the device that would be developed? Well, I think that you would have to have a lot of these plates in asymmetry, yes. something like that. Yes, that's right. the The theory predicts that the force goes up as you as you bring the plates together. So it's one over d squared. So if you, as I said, if you halve the separation, you you quadruple the force. So you can imagine. That's your gas pedal. Uh, yes, that's right. Yeah, so you could go down to the nanoscale, and then you might get an awful lot more force. But then you would need a very good dielectric, and I don't know if one exists yet. Mm. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, I'm. I'm curious what what f portions of this development process are the most restraining at the moment. Is it material science or? Is it a matter of scaling up the system or what are the main implement? Or you said, it, you know, it only happens 30% of the time. Is there a way to crank that up? Or what are the different directions that you're working in towards of um, just improving the technology? Well, yes. <clears throat> if, I, if I knew the answer, I'd, 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 I'd go and do it straight away, <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> I, we haven't worked out yet how to improve from 30%. 70% of the time we get nothing, 30% of the time we get what we expect. That There are certain things we can try. I guess the question would be like, you went from less than 30 to 30, right? You, you've mentioned that? That's right, yes. It's been quite a... It, it's been a year and a half or so for the first, well, six months, we didn't really see anything. And so what did you do to, to achieve the gains that you saw, however large or small? Okay, so we improved our system. So we have our capacitor freely floating inside a shielded cage. We, we implemented heating in various ways. We, we tried using light bulbs, for example, but <laughs> the problem was that there were interactions, electromagnetic interactions. Mm. So we now use a different method. We've used different materials. We, we came across Kapton. So we've slowly improved the system. And the results have slowly improved. But we, we need something that works every time, of course. How are you heating it now? We're using, well, it doesn't last for long, but we're using just a, a hot plate. Mm. <laughs> so just like a resistance-based heater of some That's sort. That's right, yes. Yeah. <sighs> So, I'm fascinated by this 30% of the time problem. Do you think that it's just an issue with the the way that the materials are breaking down or interacting? Because I assume that if you're passing really high, can we call it current? Yes. Well, the, the potential difference between the plates is typically two kilovolts, something like that. The, the current crossing is is only a few microamps. So it's basically, so that is to say that the dielectric is so good that it's preventing a large quantity of things passing across. Yes. The, the, the trouble is we don't want an ionic transfer of, of electrons. We want a, a uniform quantum tunneling of the electrons. And it seems quite hard to always achieve that we, we, want, we want them all to jump across simultaneously okay so quite a, what's the difference between ionic transfer and quantum tunneling so with ionic transfer the electrons find a weak point in the 
dielectric and then cross there. They all cross at that one point, and that's too chaotic. We we get it it, it explodes. Basically. It's like a lightning bolt, basically. It's like yes, a lightning bolt. Like, yeah, it's just like a lightning bolt. Yeah. So you want some sort of serious insulation between your plates, essentially. That's like perfect in structure. Yes. Okay. Well, perfect so what material. about what about turning? Is there is there a material that you could turn the dielectric on and off? Because like if you had a material that you could that was a dielectric until you flipped a switch and then it for you know however small amount of time allowed everything to pass as at once you'd get like a wave that comes across it is or is that beyond do they have materials like that i don't even know do they have temporary dielectrics i'm not sure that's an interesting idea though because that would aren't transistors sort of like that like a I little no, bit i have no yeah, idea I don't, I don't know. I'm out of my <laughs> so bed. out of my depth here yeah because i mean because it seems like what you're saying is that when it works you're still getting only a few electrons that are coming across this gap and in order for it to be a really really strong effect you would want to have just a consistent wave of them come across all at once yes that's right I'm I'm stymied in a way because I'm I'm a theorist. I'm not a electrical engineer. So, and I'm trying. I've been thinking in in space and in abstract ways, and now I'm expected to cope with the lab, which is is quite a challenge, actually. And I'm I'm lacking in engineering skills, I suppose, or material science. Seems like a great place for a collaboration. Really, you need a yes. Well, I have a good engineer working with me, but yeah, it's it's always the more the merrier. What uh, are you are you building up your lab still? Do you feel like you're ramping things up and you're 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 finding more people to bring into the fold? And what's your strategy for that? So I'm trying to be extremely open online, telling people what's what's happening, the good, the good and the bad. My my DARPA funding is just about to expire, so I'm looking for follow-on funding. So, um, the ever-present academic battle. Yes, that's right. <laughs> you yeah. know, it's really interesting because I've been. Um, I actually I found your work through Twitter. I don't know how. I th- Twitter at some point recommended your accounts to me in the early days, and I it was when we were first starting the podcast. And um, I'm going to tell on us a little bit. The podcast was initially invented as a way to corner physicists to talk about a material interpretation of the universe. And we were like, this is the only way that we're going to get people to talk about this. And so we have to put it in a large enough vessel where we talk about enough other things that we can find people that are a- asking these questions so we can we can actually get at what's happening. And you you posted a lot about the quantized inertia stuff and I was immediately intrigued because it was a way that n- no one else was really talking about it and you were also posting some you know t- early results of of the effects that you were seeing but something that I've seen on Twitter is that um there's a lot of venture capital that in the last few decades has been spent on software like venture the model for venture capital funding has been for somebody to invent a piece of software that'll let you do something, you know, a social network oh, yes, in an one form or another. And something that people have been talking about a lot lately is that venture capital should start to head towards hardware and technologies. And so if DARPA funding is running out, I don't know, I, I don't have any connections necessarily for you, but I know that like Y Combinator, which is like a big venture capital startup fund, is... Uh, trying to shift more towards funding technological applications. And oh, this what's, seems, what's that called? Y Combinator? Y Combinator, yeah. So it's this really, really big uh, tech, I, I think that you could call it like a founder fund. They, they take a cohort of people every year. You know, you have to do an application. You have to explain what you're working on. Historically, it's been like websites and things like that. But there is really a shift that's happening right now where... I feel like the the promises of the future have not been delivered. Like we don't have flying cars and people are starting to wonder, it's like, well, if we really do live in times that are advanced as we were promised, perhaps we should be focusing more on funding technological development. And so I wonder if that wouldn't be a viable avenue for you. 
Well, th- yes, thank you. I haven't heard of Y Combinator, but I will, I, I will look into it. I'm, I'm trying everything at the moment. As you can imagine, I've, I've tried about 40 different uh, possible <laughs> funders, and it, I'm, I'm just beginning, really. But um, is this so? Like, how far away is this from? So you, you see this effect. The, the effect is relatively inconsistent. And you you said that you you have an experiment in the near future that's actually going to be like taking place in low Earth orbit or where? That that's right. This American company I've been li- liaising with, and the, the two capacitor engineers also are launching something on a SpaceX rocket on June tenth. So I don't know exactly what they're launching. It's a quantized inertia thruster. There was an article about it in, in Universe Today that you could look at quite recently, <clears throat> which caused quite a lot of controversy because it appeared and then it was taken down again because physicists complained that it was impossible. And then, and then it, was oh, put back up. it was put back up with a disclaimer. And <laughs> yeah, that's so. such a that's such a weird mentality. Like you know, I think that if you went back 50 years, or I guess you'd probably have to go back farther at this point. Let's say you go back to like the 1910s and you try to explain the internet to somebody. Their their mentality about it would be that it was absolutely impossible and that there's absolutely no way and that it breaks every single technological convention that we have. And yet people still worked on it and they still pursued it and they made it reality. And it seems like we have this, there seems to be a really strong immune system in physics, especially right now. Which is that there's mm. there's a, a strong sense of what is possible, and through that lens, we decide what is worth pursuing. And it almost seems like spreading ideas about non unconventional physics has been labeled as a dangerous practice that should be stamped out at all costs. That's right. Now I think that's a shame because we we have textbooks for all the old theories. I, I think it's the duty of physicists to actually come up with something new and you you can't do that without without challenging what's in the textbooks so i i think this is very as you say it's very strong in physics because there's this idea that physics is extremely difficult and extremely precise and that the people who do it are extremely clever and they they should know best they should know best but it's not necessarily so and i think that recently they've forgotten to look at new data they're very good at reading their textbooks, but they they're not looking at the new data. And I, I think that that's my advantage that I've I've looked at the new data, the galaxy rotation, w- with a an open mind. Well, I've heard one of the tragedies of being a really intelligent person is that you can win any argument, even if you're wrong. Like, <laughs> and it it kind of works against you. I think this is why you see so many isolated, grumpy, smart people. Because it it's not all you don't always want to win an argument is the thing just because you can right your your ultimate mm-hmm. goal in any conversation should be to learn something ultimately and if you're not open to the idea that you don't know everything be just because you might be able to worm your way out of it like for sure but it, it's not necessarily a healthy mindset for a scientist. I think that's exactly right. That was Socrates idea really wasn't it he was the first one the only thing i know is that i know nothing Mm. which is a great place to start from as a a scientist also terribly disorienting right i mean there's i think Mm. it's actually i think it's we run up against this wall because there are radical people who will insist that science is pointless because you can't actually know anything for certain and therefore you don't know anything and therefore why even bother with it and I think that that's a little misguided at at the same time. Yes, that's that's that goes too far. But I I think to admit it's very difficult for humans to admit that we don't know everything. Mm. So if you say that you don't know anything, then that's a very good start. It it opens you up. But it's not actually true. We do know some things, but um... yeah, I I mean I think it's really important work too, which is why I think that you'll have more success than other people because it's long occurred to me that if we're going to actually be able to reach the stars and explore something like it's quite obvious that nothing interesting is happening 
in our local neighborhood. Interesting I mean, how. And there's, there's nothing alive, nobody to interact with. We can't really spread out into these planets in a comfortable way. They're just not appropriate. But we look out, you know, the Kepler program, we've seen there's lots of worlds out there, but they're really far away. And it's like, if we're going to get there uh, in any meaningful time frame, it seems like we have to understand how to manipulate inertia itself, like just burning our way and, and fighting against inertia it just seems like a really exhausting way to move yourself around the galaxy. Yes, ex exactly right. So I think this is the first theory that would allow interstellar travel in a human lifetime. Yeah, it's, I it's, love it. It's, prop it's propellantless. You don't have to carry sort of um, an asteroid of fuel with you to to get up to a quarter light speed. You, you can you can push off the quantum vacuum, which is is everywhere. Uh, you need a pretty good generator, though, I suppose. So there's probably still room yes. for for fusion or something that would be, uh, you know, I guess even a nuclear Maybe. reactor could do it. Yeah, um, th th there is one. The, the Safe Four Hundred nuclear reactor is, I think, it's about half a ton or something, and it produces uh, quite a few megawatts. So. I guess the only scary part there is strapping some fissile material to a rocket and throwing it into space seems a little scary to people. Although they do it, um, like the I guess it's the Voyager. They have, or... Yeah, they have done it before, so I, I don't see why why not. Do you but have I, any? I think, yeah, I, I think this theory also has. There is also a way to uh, generate electricity directly from it. Mm. Uh, that, that I don't want to talk about yet, but it's it's not too mm. different to what, what we're doing already. Um, so it could be that we could have our own generator on board, quantum mm. generator. Like a so. rebreather. That's interesting. I think at the, at the beginning of the conversation, we kind of like skipped over the the topic of gravity. Do you want to, since, since we can't talk about your uh, power source, do you want to, do? You, can we delve into gravity a little bit and how you think that it fits into this whole story? Yes, so <clears throat> I've, I've got a, a book, um, a new book coming out soon, where I show that you can derive Newtonian gravity from quantized inertia just by assuming that two... Planck masses side by side damp the the quantum vacuum between them and that will tend to pull them together and then if all you have to do is add up the number of Planck masses in a body and you can work out the attraction and it it exactly equals Newtonian gravity so that's not general relativity yet it's it's just a Newtonian form of gravity but I have an idea how to extend that to reproduce. Because I, I disagree with the results of general relativity on the scale of galaxies, but GR has been well tested in the solar system. Um, light bending by the sun, the Shapiro delay, things like that. And I can also predict the same bending of light with quantized inertia that general relativity does in the solar system. And I'm, I'm trying to publish a paper on that at the moment. So, so to summarize, I can, I can derive Newtonian gravity from quantized inertia, and I think I can derive the modifications in the solar system due to general relativity as well. And when you, can you, the, this, the, you said it was the Shapiro delay? effect? Yes, so there are several tests of general relativity in the solar system. They, they look at light bending by the sun and also the change of light speed close to the sun, which is the Shapiro delay. I think they looked at that using a, a space probe and they sent a message to it and it came back and they worked out the time difference and it, it agreed with GR. And so. the the conventional the, the the conventional explanation of general relativity would be the like the bending of space time. That that's right. Yes. 
<clears throat> but I don't like the bending of space time because I'm I'm a very strong follower of Mac. And he said you should never put an abstract concept into a theory. Mm. In in a sense, this is what gets me into the most trouble that I don't like the bending of space. <laughs> Uh, but I've got another way to predict what the bending of space produces. I, I think what's happening is that the, the quantum vacuum is not homogeneous in space. It's a bit like a refractive index, and that, that causes the bending of light. And, and this this feeds kind of into what we've been toying with with, material, with the material atomics channel, is that the presence of material and its interconnection is fundamentally what is creating the effects that you see. And so it's it's like I don't really see it as being different from general relativity because general relativity says that, you know, the presence of a mass bends space-time. And you can relatively easily transfer that to be like, okay, well, if it's not space-time that it's bending, and instead there's some kind of interconnection and connectome of the material that makes up the large object, then you have something that's coming in from the outside is going to be differentially interacting with it as it passes by. And that seems like fairly straightforward and not perhaps controversial, but it does get rid of some of the magic because like... By the way, I would love to get uh, <laughs> that reference for that mock, uh, that mock quote. Is that from his mechanics? Uh, text or I, I would love to f see that we're we're working on a book right now and that's that's a <laughs> that's a really because I think no no you know it the biggest disaster that's happened in the last hundred years is this what you said um, that people have been building they take these ideas right like you said an idea a, a relationship of some sort an abstraction an abstraction and they start moving it around and doing stuff with it and ultimately physics has to be about what bodies are doing to one another because what else is it otherwise if it's not a science of of physical bodies right things that have surfaces and can interact with one another yes and observables is is what mac, mac said he said you you should only have observables in the theory and dark matter by definition isn't an observable and not, neither is bent space so um yes yes i, I agree with with you and space too, if you really push on it, it really comes it basically means place, right? And and when you're just talking about like the place changing, it's not really explanatory. Like it might be highly descript it might be accurate, it might be descriptive, it might be true, but it doesn't necessarily explain anything on a physical level to me. Just the fact that the distances between objects are changing in a predictable way. I'm like, yeah, obviously. Like, you know, a child knows how gravity works, like they can they can fall over when they're a baby and be like, oh, there's gravity and it works this way. But they don't understand the mechanism for it. They're not like, oh, well, the atoms are pulling on each other or whatever they think, it, you know, whatever one might theorize to be happening. So, yeah. It, well, in, in my book that's coming out soon, I, I derive quantized inertia by looking at what I call, uh, well, I, I call them fireflies, but you could call them agents. So entities that, that um, are just able to remember and that they exchange photons with each other. So if you have sort of firefly A and, and B, A sends a photon to B, which returns it to A. And so A counts one, because that's the only thing that A can perceive in the cosmos, the arrival of a beam of light. And I make the assumption that time does not exist for A between the time that it emitted the photon and absorbed it and and if you do that quantized inertia comes comes out you don't have to assume that space exists all you have to do is assume that these two agents exist and light mm. i love that and, and and distance has no meaning to to a or b but if you put another part agent in there c and they they exchange photons then and say C is closer to A than B, then that would be knowable by A because the photon will come back more quickly. Mm. So then you start to build up an idea that there is distance. Mm -hmm. And, the, and the, the distance is interval given a speed limit. That, that's right, yes. And so the more, the more complex the system is, the, more, the better its 
knowledge of time and distance is so that when you get to large objects like us, we, we know very well what time and distance is, but it, it's a, an emergent property, I suppose, is what I'm trying to say. Mm, 100%. Yeah, we, we often come down to the fact that the smallest universe in which you can model any particular any phenomenon is three. Like you always need that third one to to make sense of what the other two are doing, essentially. You have to have a reference point, right? Like if you're looking at if you're looking at something, you can't be you you can't be of the thing that you're looking at mm. because you can't really you you can't start to. I, I mean, I think that the reason that we use triangulate in order to be able to as a term for explaining why we understand things, it's because we have an intuitive grasp of the fact that you have to have three. And this makes me think we had this conversation with Julian Barber a really long time ago about uh, his model of the Big Bang. And at some point he got into this thing of how the universe had to have started from a triangle. And his fundamental premise was the fact that three was this really important number, but he couldn't explain why. And we kind of got into a fight with him about it, which I feel bad. But I think that I just realized why he thought that three was so important. Mm. Because with two, you can't know. You can just experience. But with three, then you can start to create a picture of like, okay, there's this, there's an extra dimension of, of observation and interaction that allows you to create a map that you wouldn't The concept of distance to. emerges, essentially. Well, yeah, it's like, um, did you ever read that book, Flatland? No, I, I never did, actually, no. But, um... I, I, I mean, the idea is that it's, 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 exp it's exploring what can be known in a two-dimensional universe versus a three-dimensional universe. And I th think that's probably significant for understanding fundamental physics as well, which I never thought about before. So well, yes, I, I agree. Three is important because also in, in my derivation, I, I needed three. So before I got any any concept of distance. So, yeah, that's that's interesting. You have a book out? Is that is that correct? Yes. So I've written two so far. I've written a textbook in 2014, Physics from the Edge. And I wrote a, in 2021, I wrote a, a sci-fi novel to try and explain the ideas in a more accessible way called Falling Up. Oh, cool. And I'm just about to bring out, maybe within a month, an, a new book. So, uh, Covering the, the more hard science of what we've been talking about? Yes. So the title is Quantized Inertia from Anomalies to New Physics. And I... I take about 50 anomalies, like galaxy rotation or wide binary orbits or capacitors, or, and I show how they can be predicted by quantized inertia. And there's a bit about interstellar travel at the end as well. So <laughs> well, That sounds awesome. I'm getting that book for sure. So it'd be, it'd be interesting to close on, on the, the art of writing, because we're kind of deep in that right now, and we're trying to find a frame, and we're looking at... You know, what does it mean to write for an audience and what does it mean to take these complex ideas and boil them down to something that is digestible? And so I wonder what your process is for that. Well, I think the important thing is just to start start writing <laughs> and that just start writing even if, if even if nonsense comes out, eventually it'll start to make sense and you can delete the the beginning <laughs> anyway. <laughs> do you just do you make a are you very scheduled about that like do you set aside time every day to write yes i i do yeah so i tend to write in the evening so that i know that at this time i'm supposed to be writing because <laughs> uh, i have my day job of course uh so i, I write in the evening and i i like to use i i think very intuitively and, and graphically so i like to put a lot of diagrams in as well as the maths mm, nice and I, I like to put a lot of as much humor in as i as i can for my own entertainment as well as hopefully other people's so uh it sort of helps the medicine go down i suppose a bit of humor <laughs> 
Do you do you write outlines first or do you just kind of have a sense for where you want to go and you just navigate your way through? I, I wrote an outline of chapters, chapter headings. And and mostly mostly adhered to it, but I was quite flexible as well. Um yeah, because I mean, I think that the way that we've been writing, because we what we decided to do is that we wanted to take everything that we had encountered over the course of the last, we're almost at 150 episodes. So we've had a lot of conversations with people that are kind of pushing the boundaries of everything from the origin of life to the the atom. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to condense what we've learned about these various disciplines into chapters. And so we have like the origin of life, consciousness, planetary history, solar physics, atomics, and cosmology. And so it's, a, it's, it's enormously ambitious. And what we're trying to figure out is the, the level of, of depth and scope for each chapter. Because I feel like when you start to write something, you come to a point where you're like, I want to put everything here. But if you try to put everything into a work, you end up at, you know, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 pages. And it's like, that's not. <laughs> I think the important thing is, well, to, to tell a story. Mm. The, I think people love a story and that's, that's just as applicable to science as anything else. So the book should have a, a story. It should develop. So it. If if it's just a ra a random selection of of chapters, it it won't it, it'll inspire less, I think, than if if you're if you design the chapters so that they build to some overall conclusion. And for the for the one that you're writing right now, quantized inertia from anomalies to new physics, what is the story that it builds? I I suppose it's that. Great, great advances in theory are are determined by new observations, thinking about new observations or anomalies. So that's that's why the title is as it is. So I, I talk in the beginning about how physics developed because Galileo, there was a thousand years of thinking and nothing happened. And then Galileo looked at the moons of Jupiter and he realized that, oh, if the moons go around Jupiter, maybe, maybe it's possible that the the planets are orbiting around the sun, and that cut out a thousand years of, of thinking. Just as a new, uh, a new observation, a new anomaly, which it was at the time, because people thought that everything went around the Earth, and if the Earth went around the sun, then everything would simply fall behind in its orbit. And we would all fall off the earth and there'd be a trail of, of people and, and dogs, you know, and <laughs> objects <laughs> trailing behind the planet. Um, and, and that changes inertia as well, because then you realize that inertia isn't that things, that the idea isn't that things stay in one place. It's that they have a constant speed and they can, they can follow the earth in its orbit. So he started to think about inertia as well. And it, it just changed science completely, just that single observation. So then I present 50 anomalies and mm. say, look, these are, these are anomalies. And then I, I discuss them, analyze them, and show how quantized inertia was inspired by them and how it predicts each one. Why is oh, it? Yeah, oh. I love that because it seems like the most important thing that you can give to people that are coming into these fields, people, students, right, is understanding what's not working about our understanding. Whereas it's so often presented that we understand everything and you should just learn how we understand everything. But there's this, we haven't come up with a phrase for it, but there's this art of humility in science about, and it really yes, just excitement. Right. Yeah. Like excitement about, well, we like this, you know, phenomenon isn't understood. That's awesome because now there's so much work to be done and th that these are the areas. So, I mean, I definitely try to fixate on this when I'm lecturing at the university or something. I really want to just spend my time focusing on the problems more than just because you can just go to Wikipedia or whatever and read about anything otherwise. Like, there, there's no point in sitting around just hammering that into people's heads. If they're interested in the background on a particular topic, go for it. But the exciting part, the thing that will actually move the world forward, is what's not understood. So, I really appreciate exactly, that. Yes. 
but it's I know you got to run and it's been it's been really fun to have you out here and I'm super stoked on this work I really want to check out your book when it comes out and um yeah, thanks it's been a great chat I've enjoyed it yeah I'd love to meet up down the road and see if we could uh yeah once you see how this technology progresses and see what you know comes of it all and where, where you go because I feel like you're going places okay yes we'll yeah we'll, we'll see there's great potential <laughs> <laughs>